Hi guys, my name is Mark. Today we're going to be looking at the higher level 2022 physics paper and we're going to be getting straight into question six. So question six in this case is going to be a multiple choice question and we're going to have several um, different ones that we can obviously pick and some that we can leave out. Now I highly recommend that you do as many of these as you can because it's a great place to pick up marks and even if you make a little mistake um, they take your best, you know, best eight in this case. So yeah, let's get straight into question six. So having a look now at question six part A, the first thing that we're going to be asked to do is going to be associated with densities here. So what we're being told is that iron has a density of 7.87 grams per centimeter cubed. So that's an important thing to know. It's in grams per centimeter cubed. And what we're being told here is that an iron sphere has a mass of 500 grams. And then from there, we're actually going to be asked to calculate the radius. That's the important thing we're looking for here. The radius of this sphere in centimeters. Now, whenever I'm doing a physics question like this, and it mentions a few different kind of pieces of information, in this case, density, mass, and um, we're looking for a radius here, what I'll always Always do is I'll go straight to my log tables and see if there's a formula I can actually use that makes my life a little bit simpler. So if we come to page 57 of our log tables here in the forces and materials section what we're going to find is a formula here for density and that formula is going to be rho is going to equal to m over v or rho is equal to mass over um, volume and in this case mass divided by volume is going to give you um, density which is represented by that Greek letter rho. So the first thing I'm going to do here is jot down that formula that we were just looking at. So in this case it's going to be rho is going to equal to m over v and in this case we're going to be asked to find um, the radius of the sphere come back to our question here. So we're looking for the radius of the sphere and the only kind of piece of information here that we can relate to radius is actually going to be this bottom this bottom v here which in this case is volume so what i'm going to do is rearrange to have v on its own and the way that we're going to do that is we're going to have v is now going to equal to mass over rho or mass over density and because that because we're looking at this in terms of a sphere as it says in the question we're looking at it says here a sphere what we're going to have is v is going to be the formula for the volume of a sphere, which in this case is going to be um, 4 over 3 pi r, um, pi r cubed. And in this case, what we're going to do again here is we're going to rearrange to find um, or on its own, because in this case, we're just looking for the radius. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to have or here is going to equal to, and we're going to have our, we're going to have our mass, and then we're going to have our rho in here. And what we're going to do is divide by 4 over 3, so that's going to give me a 3 on the top and a four on the bottom and then we're also dividing by pi so we're going to have a pi down here on the bottom as well and then what's going to come as a result of this is we have this is or cubed so far so we need to get the cubed root of this in order to get the radius on its own so what i'm going to do is plug in all the information that we know so what we're going to know here is this is going to be the cube root and it's going to be three times the mass now the important thing to know here is that we're going to be asked for this radius in um centimeters so all of the information that we've been given here is in grams per centimeter cubed which means that we don't actually have to change any of our units here and we're still and um, we're still in the clear so what's going to happen here is we're going to have three and then we're going to have times our mass which in this case is going to be 500 grams so we're going to be running this in grams then on the bottom half we're going to have four pi which you can just plug in on your calculator and then you're going to have multiplied by our density or rho which in this case is going to be 7.87 and that's in grams per centimeter cubed so yet again because everything here is going to be in grams and centimeters cubed it means that we don't actually have to do any conversions into kilograms or meters which is really nice so pulling up my calculator here i'm just going to plug in all the information that we know now because we're looking for the cubed root we're going to press shift and then our roots on here to get the cubed root and it's going to have a fraction up there so we're going to have three and then times and this is our 500 grams which is our mass and then on the bottom we're going to have four uh shift here for pi and then this is going to be times 7.87 and that's our density and then we're going to get our answer here. so after we plug that into our calculator here we're going to get our final answer for our radius which in this case is 2.475 centimeters here and I'm just going to be rounding from the calculator answer as well. So for this question there was a total of seven marks going and you got three marks for getting your formulas correct so you can get either one of them correct in this case so and um, what I have here is our uh, rho is equal to m over v or if you said four uh, four over three pi r cubed it'll also get you your three marks there. Uh, moving on from there you got two marks for calculating the volume and then you got two more marks for calculating the radius but in this case what we've just done is done it all in one um, nice kind of fell swoop here by just rearranging to find or on its own and by getting that final answer you'd get your total of four marks but if you did them in separate stages so for example if you found out what v was and then rearranged to find um or on its own what you'd be able to find here is um you get your two marks in two separate places but because we did it all at once you get your four marks
So having a look now at part B here, we're going to be asked to do is to calculate how many electron volts are in a kilowatt hour. So there's going to be a bit of a conversion going on here. And the first thing to know actually is that kilowatt hour is going to be a measure of energy. So what we need to do is calculate the energy associated with one kilowatt hour. And we're going to be doing that in terms of joules. And now what we need to do is go from that into electron volts, which is another measure of energy, but um, just a different unit. So what we're going to do first here is find the amount of uh, joules in a kilowatt hour and then work back. So the first thing we're going to be working with here is our kilowatt hour. It's going to have one kilowatt hour. And the question is, how many um, joules in this case is that worth? Well, the first thing to know is that we have that prefix kilo. So we know that there's going to be a thousand um, watts associated with it. And then this is going to be measured in um, hours. Now, an important thing to know here is that just a watt is going to be the measure of energy per unit time. So if we're going to be running this, um, and that unit time, should I say, first of all, is going to be in seconds. So if we know that there's going to be, you know, one watt, is one joule per second. Well, what we know is it's going to be a kilowatt, so it's going to be a thousand joules per second, and we're told here that this is going to be a kilowatt hour. So if we're working in seconds already, we need to convert from seconds to an hour. So going up the ways, we're going to have 60 seconds in an hour, or should say in a minute, and then 60 minutes in our hour, and just put brackets around the front of it. What we're going to have is our one kilowatt, and that's going to be in seconds, and then multiply by 60 to get it to minutes, and then 60 again to get it to hours. Now, if you plug this into your calculator, you're going to get an answer that looks a little something like this. You're going to get three points six by 10 to the six and this is measured in joules that's an important thing to note here so um, you could also use a different prefix here you could say it's only 3.6 and i think by 10 to the six would be megajoules but um, personally i'm just going to leave it in terms of joules because it's just a little bit easier to work with when we're looking at our electron volts which we're going to do now so the question becomes how many joules are in one electron volt it's actually very easy to remember what i'm going to do is write it out first and then we're going to kind of see how you can remember it a little bit better going forwards so one electron volt so the notation for electron volt is a small e and then a capital v so one electron volt is going to equal to 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19 joules. So a very, very small amount of joules. And the reason for that is because um, you use electron volts for kind of calculations involving electrons and kind of particles like that, and very little small kind of amounts of energy. So in this case, one electron volt is 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19 joules. So if we go to our log tables here, and as I was saying, if you couldn't remember what the value for the amount of joules on electron volt is, it actually says it on the fundamental physical constants page, which in this case is going to be page 46 and it says that the electron volt is going to be equivalent to 1.6 um, and then several other decimal places by 10 to the minus 19 joules. So if you were unable to remember it at the time, um, you can very easily recall it from your log table. So now that we know how many joules are associated with a kilowatt hour and also a single electron volt, we're asked to calculate how many electron volts are in a kilowatt hour. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to divide um, the amount of joules associated with um, an electron volt into the amount of joules associated with a kilowatt hour. And this is going to give us the amount of electron volts that are inside of a kilowatt hour. So what I've done here is wrote out that little um, kind of division sum. In this case, we're going to have our 3.6 by 10 to the 6 joules for our kilowatt hour. And on the bottom, we're going to have our 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19 joules for our electron volt. And then what I'm going to do is pull up my calculator and throw this information into it to get an answer. Now, if you pull up your calculator and put this information in, what you're going to find is that the answers are going to be 2.25 by 10 to the 25 um, electron volts. Um, and I'll just say electron volts inside one uh, kilowatt hour. So that's kind of the answer that we're expecting in this case. It's because one kilowatt hour is actually a, a large amount of energy. And having one electron volt, which is going to be a very small amount of energy, obviously going to be a lot of little electron volts in the big kilowatt hour. Um, but either way, yeah, this is the correct solution in order to get your full marks. And for following this process, you'd get a total of seven marks, as you get for all of these multiple choice questions, or seven marks going for each of them. Um, and in this case, you got um, three marks and two marks, respectively, for getting the associate number of joules for each the kilowatt hour and the electron volt, uh, regardless of which way you did it. So if you got the first one right and the second one wrong, you would get three marks. Uh, but if you got the boat right, you'd get five marks in total. And then and your final two marks came from getting this answer down here, which is our 2.25 by 10 to the 25. So moving now on to part C, we're going to be asked here to draw a labeled diagram. So super important that you don't forget to draw the labels on because actually most of the marks are actually going for those labels. Um, and I've made that mistake a few times myself. So in this case, we're asked to draw a labeled diagram to show the forces acting on a piece of wood floating at rest. So if you can just picture it in your head, it's just like a piece of driftwood, if you will, just floating in the middle of a body of water. And we're asked to draw a diagram showing all of the forces acting on it and then also have a few labels on it as well. So what we have here is going to be 
our labeled diagram and I'm just going to draw in a few squiggly lines on either side to kind of just showcase that this is a block of wood actually floating in the water. And um, what we're asked to do here is we're actually being asked to show the forces acting on the piece of wood. So what we're going to have is these two forces working in opposite um, directions. So we're going to have buoyancy, which is going to be this force here. And buoyancy is going to be acting upwards. It's going to be kind of the reason that the, um, like, for example, a piece of wood is floating. It's going to have a buoyancy force acting upwards. And then we're also going to have a force going downwards, which is going to be the weight of the wood itself. Now, we're being told that this is going to be a floating piece of wood at rest. Now, when we have something that is floating, it means that the buoyancy force going upwards and the weight force, um, or should I say kind of the vector, if you will, so the buoyancy vector and the uh, weight vector are going to be exactly the same because it's going to be completely stationary. It's going to be floating in one place. And that's kind of what I have written over here. We have the vector forces are going to be equal and opposite. So that's an important thing to note here. And I've tried to showcase that by drawing um, these arrows here, uh, both these arrows, drawing them kind of in the same color and the same, like completely opposite directions and the same size. Because the same size here is kind of indicating that they're equal in uh, magnitude, if you will. So ultimately, that's all you really needed to include here. In terms, you're going to get your full marks, and the breakdown goes as follows. There was a total of seven marks going here, as like all of these uh, short questions, and um, you got three marks for saying, you know, the first one of these, which is going to be like the weight, uh, which is labeled downwards. That's going to get you three marks. And for getting the second one here, you're going to get two marks, which is going to be, in this case, the up the up thrust, which is going to be your buoyancy force, and um, now you could also call it up thrust as well. And then ultimately, you're going to get another two marks for kind of showcasing them here, that they're equal and opposite force values vectors as I've kind of represented. Now you can do this by drawing them in the same color and the same, you know, uh, size and going in different directions, or you can write it out explicitly. Either one of these is completely acceptable. So having a look now at part D, in this case, we're going to be asked to state the thermometric property of, and then we have two sub questions here. We have part I is going to be the thermometric property of a thermocouple. And then in part two, we're going to be asked to look at the thermometric property of a mercury thermometer. Now, the first important thing to note here is what's actually a thermometric property. And a thermometric property, just to kind of give you a little bit more context about what that is, in this case, is um, a property that changes measurably um, and repeatedly with a change in temperature. And um, what we're going to see is that there's two different thermometric properties here at work for each of these respective um, questions. So the thermocouple and the mercury thermometer. And what I'm going to do is we're going to have a look at them and maybe explain a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes. So in the case of part I, the important thing to know here is that the thermometric property at play is going to be voltage. Now you could also have said at this point, you could also have said something like EMF or electromotive force, but either one of these is completely acceptable. Um, and similarly for the mercury thermometer, the answer that's required here to get your full marks is going to be the liquid column length, which you could also say something like um, volume or a similar answer to length in this case would have been height. Now looking at these answers with a little bit more context to explain what's going on here, if we think about how a thermocouple works, um, it works with these two junctions. And when the junction um, is heated or cooled, a small voltage is actually generated in the electrical circuit of the thermocouple. And that's kind of where this important metric comes from, the voltage in this case, which is going to be that thermometric property, which depends upon that change in heat, um, whether it's the presence of or the absence of. Um, and similarly, if we think about a mercury thermometer, just maybe something that you have seen kind of around your own house, what you'll notice is that when it gets warmer, the level goes up. And that's because, you know, you, the way we're going to represent that is that the liquid column is actually going to change in length or height. Um, and voltage, or sorry, not voltage, volume is also a correct answer um, for the thermometric property of a mercury thermometer. Either way, there was a total of seven marks going, and you got four marks for getting this first one correct, which in this case was the um, voltage or EMF, which is a little bit more of a tricky one, um, a little bit more difficult to understand, and tends to be the one they ask quite often. And then similarly, your mercury thermometer, uh, the thermometric property that you need to get right in this case, um, you get three marks if you said any of these. So um, column length, height, uh, volume, all of these would have gotten your full three marks. So having a look now at part E here, what we're going to be asked to do is, what we're actually being told, first of all, is that transverse waves can be polarized. Um, and then building on that, we're actually going to be asked, what's meant by that term polarization? So we're going to have a, an, a fairly, you know, a standard definition here, and I'm just going to take you through that. So in this case, polarization is actually going to be defined as a process by which waves, or should I say, by which a wave's oscillations are going to be confined to one plane. So that's like the important thing to, to take away from this. What you're going to have is, we're going to have oscillations, we're going to have vibrations of a wave, and they're going to be confined to one plane. So 
Um, that's kind of the, the key takeaway from the term polarization. And um, it's important to note that only transversal waves can actually be polarized. Longitudinal waves cannot. So for example, something like sound can't be polarized, but for uh, a counterpoint would be something like light can be polarized. So um, a classic example that you might see, and I'll just write it down here, is uh, e.g. Um, sunglasses. So sunglasses work on the principle of polarization because it'll actually filter out the some of the light coming into your um, hitting the glasses and makes it easier to see when you're out on a sunny day, for example. And But yeah, either way, polarization is a process by which waves, oscillations, or vibrations are confined to one plane and it only exists for transversal waves. Either way, there was a total of seven marks going here and you got four marks for mentioning the term oscillations or vibrations and then you got three marks for suggesting the fact that these would be um, confined to one plane when you're looking at the uh, definition of polarization. So having a look now at part F, we're going to be continuing on here with the theme of waves. And in this question, we're going to be asked something a little bit different to what we were looking at before. And in this case, we're going to be told is that the sound intensity um, is 0 0.18 um, milliwatts per meter squared. Um, and this is going to be measured at a distance of three meters in any direction from a source of sound. And then what we're going to be doing is we're going to be calculating the power of that source. So there's going to be kind of a lot of stuff going on in this question um, and can be quite tricky in this case. But what we're going to be doing is first kind of recalling the formula that we need to solve this. And then we're going to be working our way through the information that we know and how we can incorporate that into our form. Now, the formula that we're going to be looking at first is going to be one representing sound intensity. And that's going to be the intensity is going to be um, power divided by area in this case. We, we already know the sound intensity, um, which in this case is going to be 0 0.18, and we know it's milliwatts um, per meter squared. So what you're going to have here is it's going to be by 10 to the minus 3, I believe, and it's going to be in watts per uh, meter squared. And from here, what we need to do is solve for P. So what I'm going to do is rearrange to get P on itself. So getting P on its own, we're going to have P is going to equal to A times, and we're going to have our 0 0.18 by 10 to the minus 3. So going on from here, what we need to do is kind of decide on what's A going to be in this case. And the required answer here to get A is that the area here is going to be represented as kind of the surface of a sphere, because what's actually happening is we have sound being emitted from this central point, and it's going to spread out in a kind of a spherical way. It's going to be spreading out, and as it gets more and more kind of further away from the um, center where it's being emitted from, what we'll see is that the area gets much, much bigger, which means that the sound intensity is going to drop off a lot quicker. And the required kind of uh, formula in order to get that, you know, correctly modeled in this case is that area is going to be represented as four pi or squared. And then we already know our formula here for, or should I say the value we have for our sound intensity, which is going to be 0.18 by 10 to the minus three. And what we need to do now is actually go back and plug in our radius. Now you might be asking yourself, what is our radius? And in that case, our radius is actually going to be a distance of three meters. Three is going to be our radius because you can kind of imagine like a big sphere of um, radius three and we're just kind of standing three meters away from that source. We're going to be seeing a much quieter um, sound uh, intensity, should I say, than if we were a little bit closer. Um, so it's important to note that. So in this case, three meters is going to be our radius. So pulling open my calculator here, what I'm going to do is fill in all of our information. So what we know is we're going to be multiplying by our area, which as we were saying earlier, is represented by pi r squared, four pi r squared, should I say. So we're going to have four times pi, and then we're going to have r squared, which is going to be three squared, which is because we're at a distance of three meters away from it. And then we're going to be multiplying that by our sound intensity, which is going to be 0 0.18. And then this is going to be milliwatts per meter squared. So we're going to have our milliwatt prefix needs to be brought into this, which is going to be um, by 10 to the minus 3. So 0 0.18 by 10 to the minus 3. And if we solve here for P, what we're going to find is that our answer is going to be 0 0.02 um, and power in this case is going to be measured in watts. So writing that down here, what we're going to have is 0 0.02, and as I was saying, this is going to be measured in watts. Now, this was a particularly tricky question, and in this case, yet again, you're getting your seven marks. You got three marks for correctly getting the formula over here for um, sound intensity, which in this case is our intensity is going to be represented by power over unit area. Uh, moving on from there, you got another two marks here for correctly identifying the kind of way of representing the area um, a certain distance away from that central um, kind of point of emission for this wave, uh, the sound. And then finally, you got another two marks for getting your correct answer at the bottom here, which means that once we add these all up, you get a total of seven marks.
So having a look now at part G, what we're going to be asked is to describe how an insulated metal sphere um, can be charged by induction. So key thing there is being induction using a nearby charged rod. So what we're going to be doing here is kind of showing how that metal sphere can be charged. And the important takeaway here is by using induction. So for this question, what I've done is kind of writing this little description here, which is going to include the answer that we need here. But I've also you know included this little drawing, this little picture, if you will, of our metal sphere and our charged rod. So this here is going to be our charge rod. And then over on the right, we have our metal sphere, which is just sitting on a stand in this case. And the way that we're going to charge this by using induction is going to be the fact that the sphere is first grounded. So that's the first thing. This um, stand in this case is not going to be kind of playing a role in the way that the charge is traveling. And um, by grounding this uh, sphere, it means that it's going to be um, in a position that we can actually uh, go ahead and charge it from. And once we have grounded this sphere, what we're going to be doing then is bring the charge rod actually near um, this sphere. And what's going to happen as a result of it is that um, we're going to have, I'm just to draw it in, this charge sphere is going to be full of, for example, we're going to have lots of little positive, um, lots of little positive charges, for example, on this uh, wire. And on our sphere, we're going to have lots of, you know, a nice mix. And when we bring these positive charges on the rod near to the sphere, what's going to happen is that all of those positive charges on the sphere will move to the other side. And the reason is positive, or should I say like charges, are going to um, repel each other. And then these negative charges, which are opposite to the positive charges on the rod will come closer to each other and it means that half the sphere is actually going to be covered in negative charges and the other half will be covered in positive charges um, and then the next thing that we take away from this is that the sphere is then going to be de-earthed so it means that while it's earthed what's going to happen is it's kind of like almost like a bridge so once we have the sphere earthed um, and we bring you know the charged rod as I was saying earlier the light charge is going to repel each other and they're going to travel down the bridge and um, down you know the earthing mechanism and into the ground because they're going to try and get away from from that um, positively charged rod and it means that once we've done that we can actually go ahead and actually remove the rod or the earthing implement I guess in this case and once we remove the earthing implement it means that all of those positive charges that were on the sphere have now gone into the ground and all that's left is our negative um, charges that we you know they were happy to live on the sphere because they were opposite in charge to the positively charged rod in this case and this results in a charged sphere and the, the, you know the sphere in this case would be negatively charged but it's important to note kind of like you know you don't have to include these charges like I have myself, you know, kind of drawn out little pluses and minuses. But if that kind of helps you understand what's going on, it will allow you to get a better understanding of what's happening. So what's initially happening is we're grounding the sphere um, with uh, some form of implement and then we're bringing the charge rod near it. And what's going to happen is all of the light charges will travel down the uh, grounding implement and go away. And all of our negative charges will remain on our sphere. And then what we do is remove that earthing implement. And what we're left with is a sphere now with lots of, um, you know, charges that are opposite to the ones on the rod. So if you, in this case, I was using just a circle. And I have loads of positive charges over here, but if you've done this in terms of negative charges, it's the same method and um, the same process will still happen. Um, but either way, it's just kind of important to understand actually what's going on here to help you kind of remember because it's easier to remember um, when you understand what's going on. So either way, there was a total of seven marks going and the breakdown was as follows. You got three marks for mentioning the fact that the earth, uh, the sphere has to be earthed. Um, which in this case is similar to being grounded um, and mentioned that the rod is near it when this occurs. Um, moving on from there, what's going to happen is that we're going to be de-earthing de -earthing the um, sphere. And by doing this, you know, staying this, you're going to be getting two marks. And then finally, by saying that you remove the sphere at the very end, or the rod, should I say, you're going to get another two marks. And as a result, you get your um, metal sphere, which is going to be charged by induction. So moving on to part H here, we're going to be moving on to um, a different section. We're going to be moving on to kind of electricity and magnetism in this case. And what we're going to be told here is that a current carrying wire of length 20 centimeters is placed in a magnetic field. And then we're told when a 55 milliamp current is flowing through the wire, and um, the maximum force um, that it can experience is 130, and we're going to have micronewtons there. And then we're asked to finally calculate the magnetic flux density of the field. So it's quite a difficult question on the face of it. A lot of information being thrown at us here. But what we're going to be doing is using a very simple formula from our log tables to make it a lot simpler for us to understand. So coming to page 62 of our log tables here, what we're going to find is that there is under the electricity kind of section, what we're going to find on the second page of the electricity section is these formulas up at the top here. And the one that we're going to be really interested in is the force on a current carrying conductor. And the reason that we're going to be interested in that is because it kind of unifies all of the information that we were given. We were told about a force, 130 micro newtons, I believe it was. 
We were also told about a length. So what we're going to have here is that force. We're also told about a length, which is this little L down here. And um, similarly, we were also told yet again about a current, which is going to be this I. And we're looking for our magnetic flux density, which is going to be represented in this case by B. So we actually know everything bar one thing in this formula, which means that this is the formula that we're going to use here to um, solve for our answer. So jotting down our formula here, we're going to have F is going to equal to B, um, I here, and then we're going to have L. So in this case, B is going to be our magnetic flux density, I is going to be our current, and L is going to be our length. And the first thing I'm going to do here is rearrange for the thing that we want. So what we want on its own is going to be our magnetic flux density, which is B. And then to do this, we're going to have to have F here divided by I and L. And now what we need to do is just plug in all the information that we know. So on the top, we're going to have our force, which is going to be 130. It's going to be in micronewtons. So we're going to have by 10 here to the minus 6. Um, similarly, as well as this, we're going to also have on the bottom our I and L. So we're going to have um, 55 milliamps. So it's going to be 55 here. Um, and then milli is going to be by 10 to the minus 3, I believe. And then this is going to be multiplied by our length, which is going to be measured in meters. So we have 20 centimeters of length here. So we need to convert that into meters. So it's going to be 0 0.2 meters. And what we just have to do is plug this into our calculator to get an answer. So by plugging this into your calculator, what you're going to find is that the answer for our magnetic flux density here is going to be 0 0.0118. And an important thing to note is what is this going to be measured in? Well, this is measured in um, Tesla. So what we're going to have is 0 0.0118 Tesla as our required answer. Now, to get your full seven marks in this case, you're going to need to get um, your formula right, which is going to give you the first four marks. So four marks right at the gate for just getting your formula. And then for rearranging it and plugging in what we know, um, you're going to get your answer here for B, which in this case is going to give you your full marks, which is going to be three. So having a look now at part I, we're going to be asked a similar question to that as before, but we're going to be working with uh, resistivity and resistance and kind of a few parameters like that instead of our uh, magnetism. So both kind of coming from the same family of question, which is electricity. And in this case, we're going to be told that a tungsten cube has side of two centimeters. And we're told that it also has a resistance of 2.8 micro ohms, so a very small amount of uh, resistance. And then we're, you know, then we're being asked here to calculate the resistivity of tungsten. So the first thing I'm going to do here is pull up um pull up our log tables and get a formula that's going to unify all of these parameters so having a look now at part 61 of the um log table screen looking at the electricity section and in this case the question or says the formula that we're going to be using here is for resistivity which is what we're going to be asked for in the question and what we're being asked here uh, is for resistivity and the formula that's going to model that is going to be rho which in this case stands for resistivity so just to make sure you don't get it confused for the symbol for um, density and um, rho in this case which is going to denote resistivity is going to equal to Ra over L, resistance times area divided by length. So we're going to be using this formula here to get um, our required solution. So first thing first, I'm going to jot down our formula. So we're going to have rho is equal to Ra over L. And this is already in a form that we want because we're looking for resistivity, which means that we have kind of everything arranged how we need it. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do here, which is the next thing, is I'm going to draw a small diagram of what we're actually working with here. Um, and the reason for that is it makes it a little bit easier to understand what's going on. So what we're going to be working with here is a two centimeter by two centimeter cube of tungsten. So in this case, we're going to have a two centimeters here and we'll have two centimeters on the top here. And what's happening is we're passing, uh, we're asked to find the resistivity of the tungsten. Now, we already have our formula here with a different piece of information that we need to plug in. The first thing we're going to be doing is plugging in resistance. Now, we're told this in the question, so we're going to be 2.8 and it's micro ohms. So the prefix we need to have is by 10 to the minus six. And then we're multiplying this by an area. Now, you might be asking, well, what area in this case? Well, this is going to be a cube, as it says in the question, we have cube here, which means that the area is just going to be of one of these sides here of um, the two by two cube. Now, another important thing here is it needs to be measured in meters squared. So what we're going to have is our 0 0.02 and then we're going to just square that there to get that into our meters squared. And then similarly on the bottom, we're going to have our length, which we were told is yet again, it's going to be a two centimeter deep cube. I'll just write that down there. Two centimeter deep cube. So we're going to have our 0 0.02 on the bottom and this should give us our final correct answer. So if you plug this into your calculator, what you're going to find is that the correct answer in this case is going to be 5.6 um, and it's going to be by 10 to the minus 8 ohms meters. So this is ohm meters, um, should I say, is the unit for resistivity in this case. And yeah, nice and simple question here. Actually, just one formula here to get you your full marks. And in order to get those full marks in this case, you were getting four marks for correctly getting your formula. So just saying that over here, we're going to have four marks left. And you got another three marks to give you your total of seven by getting your answer here correct at the end.
So having a look now at part J here, we're going to be moving on to a question about the Bohr model. And in this case, we're going to be asked to describe how this model um, of atoms explains emission line spectra. So this is going to be a definition, kind of like a paragraph almost, should I say, um, explaining all the information that we need to. And what I'm going to do is write that down and kind of go through it and highlight some of the buzz terms. So having a look now at the required solution, in this case, you know, to properly describe the Bohr model, what we know is electrons are going to occupy different energy levels. So that's an important takeaway way here and um, they're going to occupy different energy levels within the atom and when they occupy higher up energy levels they're eventually going to fall down to a lower one and this is just because they're a little bit unstable when they're occupying higher up energy levels um, and as a result of them falling down as this occurs should I say energy is going to be released and it's going to be released in the form of a photon of light um, and these photons of light are of a particular frequency and are the actual line emission spectra for that element. So, so um, depending on which element you're going to have, you're going to have different emission line spectra. Um, but either way, they are created by electrons occupying higher energy levels, falling back down and releasing photons of a particular frequency, which in, you know, as a result of this is going to generate a specific line emission spectra for that element. Another way you could have modeled this is by using a formula, which in this case is going to be E2 minus E1 is going to equal to HF. And this is just going to say that the energy um, associated with the higher up energy level E2 minus the energy level uh, or the energy associated with the energy level E1 um, is going to equal to the energy you know change between the electron falling from the higher up one to the lower one and as I was saying it releases a photon which occurs which is going to be modeled by the formula hf which is going to be Planck's constant times the frequency so basically this is just kind of summing up a lot of what we've just said in a nice neat formula the change in energy is going to be in the form of a photon a particular frequency which results in the creation of emission line spectra either way there was a total of seven marks going and the breakdown was fairly simple you got four marks for including kind of anything along the lines of you know, an electron falling from one energy level to another, which is something that we include kind of in the first half of our um, description here. And then you got another three marks for saying that as a result of this, it produces photon um, or even like a frequency wave. And um, if you wanted to say um, of a particular color or frequency, which is kind of actually the characteristic line emission spectra. And um, using this formula that I have down here in the bottom would actually kind of sum up a lot of that information yourself. But personally, I just like to write it down as well, because it kind of explains the examiner that I know what I'm talking about. Moving on now to part K here, what we're going to be asked is, you know, what actually is thermionic emission? And then we're going to be asked, where does it occur in an X-ray tube? So what I'm going to do here first and foremost is define thermionic emission, and then we can talk about an X-ray tube, how they generate X-rays, and um, where the thermionic emission actually occurs. So as far as thermionic emission is concerned, thermionic emission is actually defined as the release of electrons from a hot surface. So that's kind of the key takeaway here. It's actually the emission, you know, the release of electrons, so just underlying release there as well and um, the emission or release of electrons from a hot surface and then the question comes down to where does this occur in a x-ray tube and the answer for um, an x-ray tube in this case is going to be at the cathode so in the example of the x-ray tube this is going to occur at the cathode so what's actually going to happen here is that the cathode is going to get very hot and emit these um, electrons which are going to, um, in this case, are going to hit a bl uh, block of lead, which is going to create um, the x-rays. But what we're going to be asked here is for the thermionic emission where that's occurring, which in this case is the cathode. And for getting this right, you got another seven marks, and the breakdown was um, fairly simple. You got two marks for mentioning the release of electrons. You got a further two marks for saying this is for a hot surface. And then finally, you got your last three marks for mentioning the fact that this was uh, coming from the cathode in a x-ray tube. So moving on now to the final part, which is going to be part L. In this case, there's going to be two questions that you can do. It's going to be A or B, and um, it's multiple choice as well. And in this case, you know, one part's going to deal with uh, nuclear physics, in particular the branch, you know, particle physics, talking about electrons, positrons, their families, um, you know, how they can annihilate and create and all this other stuff. And then the second one is going to be something like applied electricity and circuits. So we're going to be doing both of these. And the first thing we're going to be having a look at here is going to be the particle physics question, should I say. And in that case, what we're told is that pair annihilation, so just underline that pair annihilation of an electron and a positron occurs in um, a positron emission tomography, you know, PET scanner is kind of the short for it, and then we're asked to write an equation for this annihilation. So what you can do here is I'm going to first draw a little diagram to kind of remind me of what's actually happening here in annihilation um, of this electron and positron, and then we can use that to write out our formula. So having a look now at our small diagram here, which is going to represent um, the annihilation of our positron and electron here, what we're going to have at the top is our positron, which can be seen in the positive charge of the electron, and then similarly to 
uh, you know, kind of the same, but oppositely, we're going to have our electron on the bottom with our negative charge. And what's going to happen is these two particles are going to smash together. And as a result of this, we're going to annihilate each other. And when they annihilate each other, what's going to happen is um, these two, the arrows are kind of, uh, you know, just symbolizing what's happening here. These two photons are going to be released. And in this case, using the term HF, um, it's just kind of describing the energy of a photon. So that's just one way of doing it. And um, certainly you could also use the notation of gamma. So just writing that down, gamma here, which is another way of writing um, the, the photons being emitted here. Um, and what we're asked to do is write down an equation. So the drawing here isn't quite enough. What we have to do is write down the equation. And then we're going to be doing that is by kind of just observing the diagram and kind of writing down what we see. So what we see on the left hand side um, is that going into the reaction, we're going to have an electron and we're also going to have a positron. And what's going to happen is those two things are going to, you know, come together and they're going to react. And we have a little arrow here to kind of symbolize that. And as a result of these things reacting, what we're going to have is we're going to have two HF, which is going to be our two positrons released. And um, similarly, you could also um, just write it in brackets here. You could also have two gamma, which would be the same thing as two HF, but just saying, you know, representing photons a little differently. Either one of these is um, correct in getting your full marks. So either way, there was a total of seven marks going. And you got your four marks marks in this case for first um you know correctly writing down the electron and the positron part of the reaction and then you got your other three marks for correctly writing down your two photons and in this case if you took the notation as two hf or two gamma either way you get your full marks so now that we've answered the first part, which was on particle physics, we're going to be looking at the second part, which is going to be applied electricity in circuits. And in this case, we're asked to draw the symbol for an AND gate. That's the first thing we have to do. And then we're asked to write out a truth table for an AND gate also. So let's get straight into that. So what we can see here is I've already drawn out the symbol and done out the um, truth gate. And we'll have a look at that now. But the first thing to know here is that this here is going to be our symbol for our AND gate. And just to, you know, also say you could also have done it using a different notation. So we're going to have our box here. And and then we're going to have our ampersand, which is poorly drawn in this case. But these are both symbols for um, AND gates. Now, personally, I prefer the first one because it's a little bit easier to draw. But um, yeah, it, and it's also a little bit more common. And similarly, we're also asked to do a truth table out for this AND gate. And that's going to be done out over here. And what we can see is that we're going to have our inputs, um, our inputs on the left, uh, these kind of two columns on the left hand side, which is going to be this one here and this one. And when we AND 0 and 0, what we're going to get is this 0 over here. When we AND 1 and 0, Zero, we're going to get uh, zero, zero and one is going to give us zero again. And then when we have uh, one and one, we're going to be left with one. So this is the required um, truth table in order to get your full marks. So this is a little more of a complicated question in terms of the marking. There were seven marks going and you got three marks for just drawing out the correct um, diagram in this case, which is a symbol. And then moving on from there, there was four marks associated with the table. However, you got one mark for each row of this table that you got correct. So after you got all four rows correct, you just get four times one, which would would just give you your total of four marks and adding those together you get your total of seven for this question. Just a quick note here on the question referring to AND gates. If you go to your log tables on page 78 in the logic gate section, it's actually going to give you the um, diagram required. So these are going to be your AND gates here. And you have your two different ways of representing them. So we have this top one, that's kind of the more familiar one to myself. And then you'd have this other one, including your little ampersand symbol. And um, it's just a nice and handy kind of thing to remember because um, questions where it's like, do you know, draw out the symbol when they're given to you in uh, log tables is just easy marks. So um, either way, nice and handy in your log tables.